Rush hour on the 405 in Los Angeles, California. What you're seeing is nothing out of the ordinary. Los Angeles is 405 North and 405 South are both mentioned in the list of the top 10 most congested freeways in the country. Now take a moment to really think about what you're looking at. Tossing aside the environmental and other negative consequences of this method of transportation, is this fun? Who enjoys the constant braking and gassing and honking and boredom and wishing you'd gotten on the road sooner or wishing you'd waited longer? Or you get the point. So what did officials do to solve this problem? They added more lanes and made it worse. According to the LA Times, traffic congestion has increased 6% and it's cost us over a billion dollars. Everyone knows Los Angeles' public transportation needs work, but in order for us to figure that out, we decided to travel from our suburb to Los Angeles. The first obstacle, we had no idea where to go. Living in a suburb, there are bus stations nearby, but nobody really knows where they go and where to travel to next. Luckily, we had Google Maps. When we got on the bus, there were probably two people, even though the bus could hold 60. It was kind of discouraging to see how little people were actually taking the bus. It was even more discouraging to see that the routes were actually starting to be combined. After about an hour of traveling, we had traveled 17 miles. After another hour, it was time for our second transfer, the subway. We had no idea what to expect. Would it be empty? Unfortunately, it was empty. While people were above ground, wishing they could get home faster, there was nobody on the subway. After three hours of taking the bus, to taking another bus, to taking the subway, we had traveled 37 miles, even in LA's worst possible traffic. It shouldn't take you three hours to travel 37 miles. And that's where the problem arises. No matter how bad traffic gets, or how high gas prices get, people in Los Angeles will have no better alternative than taking their cars. It seems almost ridiculous that a majority of people still haven't noticed that with many people traveling to the same location, mass transportation would be a much better solution. Even when it's shown again and again that other methods are faster, safer, and healthier, people still choose cars as their method of transportation simply because there's no alternative. Well, I'm Joe Galliani, and I'm currently the organizer of the South Bay 350 Climate Action Group. And uh, I've been working full time in the environmental community and field since about 2007. Well, I've lived in the Los Angeles area now since 1976. So I have seen the era of zero public transportation, and I've seen the evolution of a burgeoning public transportation here in Los Angeles. If you're a bus rider, uh, you can get pretty much anywhere, but it might take you several more hours than it would take you to drive or if you were to be able to take a subway or a light rail car. So Los Angeles has a long way to go, but for those of us that have been here long enough, it's come a long way. I, I'm here now at the Redondo Beach uh, Green Line Station, and I can take a train from here uh, to the Blue Line Station and transfer and take that train to anywhere I want to go in downtown Los Angeles. So. I can take a train now to go to a Laker game from my house in Redondo Beach. Of course, it takes me 25 minutes to drive to the station and another hour to get to the game, but that's, that's the growth pains of LA public transportation. A large portion of Americans strongly believe that cars are the best form of transportation. Paying 40 plus dollars to fill up their tank, sit in traffic, waste time, None of this seems weird to them. They fail to see the consequences of this mentality. In 2012, about 31,000 crashes occurred every day, causing an average of 92 deaths per day. That's a total of 32,750 deaths per year. And that doesn't include all the people who lived through these accidents, only to become physically disabled for the rest of their lives. 
For those of us who are lucky enough to avoid accidents on the road, no one is safe from the stress and inactivity that occurs during commutes to work, school, friends' houses, events, etc. This is causing severe health problems and in turn driving up our health care costs. According to a government public health site, obesity has emerged as a major driving force of health care costs. In 2006, the economic burden of obesity in the county was estimated at 6 billion, including 3.6 billion in health care costs and 2.4 billion in costs due to lost productivity. Why is our obesity rate so high? It's largely because there's too much sitting going on. People wake up, drive to work, sit in a desk for eight hours, drive home, sit at a table to eat or socialize, watch some TV, and then it's off to bed to repeat the cycle. No matter how few minutes doctors say that everyone should exercise a day, it still seems to be too many to fit into a daily routine. The problem is, exercise shouldn't be something that everyone needs to fit into their day. Exercise should be a natural part of the day, something unavoidable, just like it was throughout our evolution. According to the World Health Organization, approximately 3.2 million deaths each year are attributed to insufficient physical activity. In places where public transportation is the norm and people are less likely to drive cars, the obesity rates are significantly lower. Take San Francisco, for example. Car driving is nowhere near the most viable method for transportation, and it is apparent in their obesity rate. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, only 10.5% of people in San Francisco are obese. That's half the amount compared to Los Angeles's 21.5%. And this doesn't include the people who are simply overweight. Cities all over the world, such as Amsterdam at an 11.4% obesity rate, have one thing in common. Their citizens ride bikes. People typically don't comment on the benefits they receive from not using a car. Exercise, the ability to avoid traffic, having their own lanes. This is expected, and the idea of owning a car seems wasteful, almost silly to them. Well, I live in Amsterdam, so I uh, mostly use my bike to get around. Uh, it's most easy. And then mm, sometimes I take the train to visit my parents. How often have you used a car in the last year or so? Uh, not so much. Hmm, maybe 20 times. How hard would it be to have a car here? Uh, expensive. Not that hard, but expensive to park. And, yeah. So. so you feel like you saved a lot of money not driving around and just using other yes. kinds of transportation? Yes, and public transport is good and especially in the city, but a bicycle is perfect, so I don't need it. I don't need a, a car. Hi, I'm Yair. I'm uh, 20 years old. I live in Amsterdam and I'm studying HR. Uh, how often do you use the other means of transportation around uh, Europe besides car? Most of the time I, my bicycle and sometimes the, the metro or the bus if it rains. But like always the bicycle. Um, how often in the last year have you used a car? Uh, none. I don't have my driver's license. Oh wow. How old are you? 20. It's normal here. <laughs> yeah. You don't need a car. So. Yeah. Contrast this attitude to Los Angeles, where police have been known to ticket bikers for not riding in a bike lane, which in many cases aren't even provided. Sir, why is it necessary to pull me over? Are you protecting the public by pulling no, me over for going the I wrong way you down you're a bicycle? The wrong way on the bike path, which is dangerous. Dangerous. D yeah, it's a joke, right? But right, Officer Gracie? It's no, dangerous. It's not a joke. Instead of creating more bike lanes, they create more car lanes. This causes people to continue their mentality that it's better to be in a car, and people riding bikes are taking up space that should be used for cars. There's a couple of other transportation alternatives that I think uh, need to be part of the mix when you talk about public transportation, especially here in the South Bay of Los Angeles where I live, where the feeling is that uh, we're kind of a built environment already, and that there isn't a tremendous amount of room for more infrastructure. So in places like this, um, what I really like to think about is the, com the complete streets concept, which is uh, now sweeping cities across the country, where we make the, the roads share, shared roads for more pedestrians and more bicycles. 
Uh, we live in about the most perfect climate there is in the country uh, to bicycle. And if we had a really great bicycle system of interconnected routes where you could get to point A and, and point B on a protected bicycle route where you didn't think you were taking your life in your hands going on the roads here, um, that would go a long way. That's zero emission transportation, relatively low cost, and it would at the same time work on our nation's obesity and diabetes epidemic. So it's a win-win-win. If you take a walk through downtown Los Angeles, you'll notice areas where businesses and foot traffic are lacking. Once cars were popularized, the effects of urban sprawl on the city became evident. Throughout the years, as businesses in Los Angeles struggled to stay afloat due to lack of customers, the cost of rent became too much and the buildings slowly emptied. Eventually, the cost of maintaining the buildings wasn't worth it anymore and the owners made the decision to demolish them and turn them into a continuation of our car problem, parking lots. These memories of what once were thriving businesses can be seen all over downtown. The bare walls of the buildings next to them serve as a reminder of what was once there, back when downtown was filled with pedestrians. Although downtown LA does have a decent amount of walking traffic, it pales in comparison to other big cities. Again, let's look at San Francisco. With the number of people walking by all day and all night, it's free advertising for businesses. It doesn't take statistics to see that foot traffic is good for businesses. Businesses, however, aren't the only ones that benefit from foot traffic. The people themselves benefit as well. When thinking about the amount we have to pay to own a car versus a metro card, the car is astronomically more expensive. Down payments, insurance, tune-ups, gasoline, taxes, these are all extra expenses one has to think about when owning a car. And the alternative? Well, herein lies the problem. For a well-designed city such as London, a small card can get you virtually anywhere around town for about $2,800 a year. On the flip side, gas alone costs well over $2,000 yearly, not to mention monthly car payments ranging from around $120 to $400. And then there are checkups every three to six months, which costs a minimum of $200 every appointment, and this is if you don't need repairs. In other words, the cost of a car is more than twice as much as if one were to have a yearly pass. Say, hi, I'm Matteo, I'm from Rome and I'm a mechanical engineering student. In my life is really important public transportation because with metro I can reach all points of Rome in really less time than buses or trams. Do you have a car? No, I don't have a car in Rome. Why? Why it's so expensive and I don't need substantially a car because of the I traffic in Rome. You can drive very easily a car in Rome and you can park it everywhere. And obviously if you have to go in the school with your car you have to wait maybe half an hour to find a, find a place you can park your car. In Italy the, ca the gas costs a lot but uh, using public transportation oh the first fact is that you that you are not obligated to pay your ticket in Rome and I have my early ticket and with my early ticket I can reach all the parts of all the areas of Rome I have to reach. How much it's does the yearly ticket cost? 250 for a year. That's yeah, not so much. And how much does gas cost? Uh, maybe Two, two euros for a liter. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's expensive. We know very well. <laughs> oh.
Public transportation is one of the absolute keys to solving the climate crisis that we're currently in. Where we stand today, we're at 400 parts per million of CO2 in terms of the atmosphere. We have a carbon budget that's quickly dwindling. There are some scientists that say in a worst case scenario, we have 11 years before we reach uh, our carbon budget and get us to two degrees of global warming, which every scientist has agreed is the, the danger zone from which we will not recover. So when you understand that automotive uh, transportation and transportation overall is such a huge percentage of our greenhouse gases and the emissions that we emit, um, you can see that that's one sector where we can really make a difference. If we can get people out of ice, out of internal combustion engine cars, and into public transportation, especially when it's electrified uh, transportation, uh, we're doing a, a huge job and in terms of being able to reduce our emissions and being able to reduce our greenhouse gases. And frankly, you know, with the clock ticking, uh, it can't come soon enough. During World War II, Los Angeles' smog was strong enough that some people suspected a Japanese chemical attack. Many doctors believed that the gaseous chemicals would lead to lung cancer and other diseases. It wasn't until 1975 that the U.S. required new cars to have catalytic converters, a device that converts toxic pollutants in exhaust gas to less harmful substances. Although car emissions are not as harmful as they used to be, the process of extracting and producing oil is just as environmentally unfriendly, and it's beginning to exponentially increase in price. Many countries have already started dealing with peak oil, and yet we still continue to fill up our tanks bi-weekly. With a good public transportation system, these problems are virtually non-existent in comparison. As we all know from San Francisco's electric bus system, we don't need oil to drive buses around LA. Furthermore, all subways use this very same system and run entirely on electricity. With this knowledge, cities should know not to spend money on freeway expansion and instead use it for a more desirable public transportation system. Well, of course, you know, when it comes to great models of best practices, you just have to look a little further north at the Bay Area. And whether it's BART uh, throughout San Francisco and uh, out on into Oakland, it's the what, what you might call the all of the above mix of public transportation. It's buses where that makes sense. It's uh, light rail where that makes sense. It's heavier rail in other areas where that should prevail. Um, and it's back to the future with the cable cars. I mean, how many cities across this country would love to have a system even as old as it is, like San Francisco's famed cable cars to get around? Um, you know, I'd never think about renting a car when I fly to the Bay Area and I'll go anywhere from Berkeley to Oakland uh, to Tiburon to Sausalito and I don't need any any individual car, I can take a wide variety of public transportation and you know we're envious down here to be to be honest with you and it's um, it's that way in so many other major cities across the country it's kind of embarrassing uh, to live in Los Angeles and not be able to tell somebody that when they fly into LAX they can get right on the train and go wherever they want to go because they can't. During the post-World War II era, the suburban population exploded during the economic expansion. Returning war veterans who wished to start a settled life moved in masses to live a simple life in the suburbs. Car ownership rose exponentially, and wider roads were built to compensate them. Soon enough, every middle-class citizen owned a car and had switched from trains and trolleys to the automobile. Those who couldn't afford a house and a car were considered lower class citizens. They got around using public transportation, and eventually, this public transportation became associated with being poor. Through the evolution of cars, more and more lower class citizens have begun to take the bus around these suburbs, as the price of cars and gasoline continue to rise. On the other side of the social spectrum, the high class citizens have continued to buy cars, this has caused the idea of public transportation in Los Angeles to become something that upper-class citizens don't want to lower themselves to. A bigger problem with most American suburbs is that they're scattered and don't connect with major cities. As a result, people need cars to get to them and once inside, still need cars to get around. Any hope of being able to walk anywhere at an efficient pace is lost. But surely this is not always the case. Just outside the city of Berlin lies a quiet suburb 
that can be compared to one in California, except for one difference. This suburb was connected directly to the S-Bahn, one of Berlin's subway systems, which allows all Berliners the opportunity to work in the city, but still be able to live in a quiet suburb. This becomes effective for all parties, as there's no traffic. People can still live outside a city and pay a small amount to ride every day, saving money for other activities. Going back and restructuring Los Angeles suburbs is not a reasonable idea, but there are ways to push us back in the right direction. By raising awareness of these problems and showing people that public transportation is not just for low-class citizens, we can get enough people on board to speed up construction of Los Angeles busways, subways, and trains, and hopefully get them to run close enough to the suburbs to make a train a more viable option than driving. The idea of social advantages in public transportation is an interesting concept when it comes to Los Angeles because we are known as a community that doesn't mingle. Um, New York, and I just read uh, a piece on this in the Los Angeles Times recently, New York really prides itself on the fact that uh, the subway is the great equalizer, that it's, uh, that it's where democracy comes to life because you have captains of industry rubbing shoulders with housekeepers, and that no matter who you are and what your status is in life, um, it all comes together in public transportation. And that may be so, but um, you know, another idea about that is it may be so when it comes to transportation, but then those people go to very different worlds, they don't eat in the same restaurants, they don't go to the same bars, they don't socialize at the same level, so if it were really an equalizer, it might go beyond the transportation. But there's no doubt that we live in, in a, an enclosed society here, that we're completely siloed in Los Angeles when it comes to transportation because we're in our individual cars, so few of us even carpool. Um, and we don't ever talk to anybody else and we don't engage with other people and it's very easy for us to lead these quiet lives of desperation encased in our, in our metal cylinders as we go down the road and uh, I think the, the greatest amount of social interaction we have under our current circumstances is to give each other the finger uh, when we cut each other off or, or, or make a turn without using our signal light. So it would be fantastic to get people in Los Angeles on the same subway cars, talking to one another and interacting and living together. Besides social structure, cars inadvertently don't allow you to be physically social with the outside world. You can't text, you can't call, you can't do anything but sit in your secluded box and think about all the time you're wasting. So again, why would anyone choose this over the alternative? Even when traveling alone, Public transportation never fails to provide entertainment for everyone on board. Well, clearly, when it comes to the gold standard of public transportation, it's Europe. Um, and it's not just one place. It's, it's bullet trains at high-speed rail in places like Japan or even China. Um, it's, if you want to take a look at a great, great model, it's Amsterdam, where that is a city run by bicycles. And that makes so much sense for them. Um, and it works, and it's worked for a long, long time. And cars are, I would dare say, a second-class citizen when it comes to a place like Amsterdam. But whether it's Germany or France or the UK and your ability to go from the continent uh, under the channel, they have led the way. And part of the reason is their gasoline has always been so much more expensive than ours. That's uh, part of the reason why you see such small cars dominate the, uh, the landscape when it comes to automobiles. And it's part of the reason why electric cars are such a great idea for Europe. With a relatively new metro system in LA, things are starting to get better. In 2012, the metro had an average weekday ridership of 362,904 citizens a day. So yes, there are people who do realize the potential of Los Angeles' metro. With more riders every year, there have already been plans of expansion. Who knows? Maybe in a few more years, the metro could expand further down towards San Diego. We're the newest city of any of them. We were laid out in a plan, from a planning perspective as a place to get around uh, in a car with. Uh, car trans, every place is, is highly accessible. We have more parking than most places in New York. You can buy a parking space for a million dollars a year. Um, here, you know, you can park almost anywhere you want to go. And, and we make a big deal if you have to walk oh no, I have to park all the way at the end of the parking lot and walk to the... 
So we're definitely a car culture, and, and that's one of the things we're going to have to change because the same thing that's made it such a great place to live and get around and, and go from the mountain to the desert to the sea all in one day is also what's choking us and you know, like killing our climate. So time for an, a new way to think about it.